My name's Tim Edwards, and tonight I am joined by Anna Bryan to interview Diane Coyle, a professor at the University of Cambridge and best-selling economist of GDP. A short but affectionate history, am I correct on that one? Yes. Brief, Brief affectionate yep. history, my, my apologies. And a, uh, not to mention the, um, a, a wide range of accolades in a career spanning academia to the public sector. Diane's work has predominantly covered the difficulties and challenges of using GDP as a metric, uh, particularly in areas in which GDP cannot measure, such as, uh, such as areas in the economy uh, where women provide, as well as technology and sustainability. Uh, we look forward to having her on and having a fantastic discussion. So over to you, Anna. Hello, everyone, and um, welcome again, Diane. Um, we'll cover some of your work, especially GDP we'll start with, but we're also going to cover um, your, your most recent textbook, uh, Market State and People, and your forthcoming book, Cox and Watson's, like, see if we can tease any of the content from that. And as Richard says in the chat, if you have any questions throughout this talk, please and um, you know post them in the chat or if you're a bit shy send them it directly to me or Tim or Richard or Ben who will all um who will ask them or pass them on to us. So hello again Diane I hope you're well um and what I want to start with to sort of like launch our discussion is an article you wrote in the New York Times last year about um the persistence of unpaid work by women in the home and um how the coronavirus and the pandemic had sort of like highlighted this issue and highlighted the fact that despite women's move into the workplace, the fact that women still do the bulk of domestic work. Um, and what I want to ask you basically is what does this tell us about sort of central critiques of GDP? And um, how has sort of COVID-19, has COVID-19 sort of led to a broader discussion on this? Um. This is one of the questions that's been asked about GDP ever since it was invented in the wartime and post-war years. And the question really is, what counts as the economy? Because the system of measuring was devised not only for countries like the UK and US, uh, but also for low-income countries. It was developed by the United Nations and meant to apply to all nations. And so right from the start, there was a debate about how to measure what we would now call informal work, so things done that are not in the paid economy. And that includes all of the unpaid work in, in, in the home, but also in low income countries, things like farming for your, own, um, for your own eating or making clothes for yourself at home and so on. And um, the decision was taken after some debate in the 1950s to exclude that from um, the, de the definition of GDP. So it was put outside what um, is called in the jargon the production boundary. And because at least in um, the developed economies, most of that work is done by women, it meant that a lot of those household activities that are obviously economically valuable, you know, looking after children, cooking, cleaning, repairing the house and so on, they, they've all got value, but, but they were counted as being outside the economy and it had this, this very strong gender bias. So from time to time, the debate has revived about um, is that uh, the right place to put the production boundary or should there be efforts to measure this work that's done outside the market economy? And a lot of countries do occasional or even more regular time use surveys. So it isn't that it isn't measured, we can measure it. We can measure how many hours people spend doing paid work and unpaid work. And we can value the unpaid work using either what those people could have earned themselves in another job or using the market rate for being um, a cleaning person or a, um, a chef somewhere. And that, that gets done from time to time. I had already started thinking about the production boundary because before the pandemic, because of um, the way digital technology is changing how we use our time. If you think about what happened in the 1960s and 70s when lots of women went out to paid work and bought uh, uh, hoovers and washing machines and uh, paid people to do childcare and bought ready meals and so on, that expanded the marketed economy. And so it looks like they grew really quickly and were very productive. But part of that was an artifact of the shift in activities over the production boundary. 
digital has been reversing that in some ways because things that we used to pay for are now done inside the home. So things like sorting out your own travel agency, doing your banking online have been substituting for paid activities. And so I started thinking about this as one of a range of um, possible reasons that we're not measuring what's going on in the economy properly because of digital transformation. But then as you said in your question, Anna, um, this issue has become more acute because of the pandemic, because um, in different countries, there's data suggesting that a lot of the impact is falling on women, uh, partly in picking up things like homeschooling and doing more at home, but also partly in being uh, more likely to have lost their job or be furloughed because the sectors um, heavily hit by the pandemic have um, often been uh, heavy, heavy employers of women. And, um, you know, so this is this, this question about how do we really value this part of the economy that's essential to everybody's lives and well-being? Um, and, and should we be thinking about measuring it more systematically than, than we have done? So it's raised that old question that dates back to the or origins of GDP. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic explanation. Thank you, Diane. And um, I think what this sort of has implications for is that one of the sectors we're measuring the most poorly is one of the fastest, well, since, you know, say the 90s, is one of the fastest growing sectors in the economy. So what does that sort of have implications on the way, uh, sort of have effects that, on the way that, you know, um, we sort of talk about other, you know, issues in the economy, such as productivity, um, policy making, tax, etc. Uh, I am, uh, as you can tell, very nerdily interested in economic measurement issues, and it sounds really boring, but the statistics are how we see the world, how we understand what's going on in the economy and tell ourselves stories about it. And they're also used by policymakers. So a lot of policies are justified on the basis that they will increase GDP or not. And um, so there has been for some years now, since the mid 2000s, a slowdown in growth and a slowdown in productivity compared to the bit earlier. And nobody entirely understands the reasons for it. I think it's a bit like one of those Agatha Christie murders where, murders where it turns out that everybody did it. And there are lots of, lots of guilty culprits. Um, so the aftermath of the financial crisis would be one example. Um, the debt overhang from that, um, the aging of the population would be another example. So there are lots of headwinds to growth. But the bit that interests me is um, what's happening in areas, areas of the economy where digital is having a big effect. One piece of work I did with some colleagues from the Office of National Statistics looked at telecommunications prices. And the official index showed these haven't gone down at all for about seven years. We were talking to some engineers and they said, that, well, that's nuts because during that period, the amount of data that people are using has rocketed and all of the technology has become much better. You know, we can compress more into the wires we've got, the speed is faster, the latency uh, and the dropping, dropping calls has vanished. So why aren't you capturing any of that improvement in quality? And so we did a range of um, indices that tried to capture that better in the price that's used to deflate the revenues of the telecommunications companies. And um, we got a range of numbers depending on the method. The method where you just look at the price people pay per unit of data that they use showed a 90% drop rather than no drop. And the Office of National Statistics is now implementing one that shows about a 50% a, a drop in the price instead of none. And this adds, 0.16 percentage points to GDP for seven years. And that doesn't sound very much. It takes it from, I think it's 2.0% growth to 2.1% growth, but that's just one price and one part of the economy. And there are many, many parts of the economy now that are, are quite hard to measure because we just don't have a good handle on um, how to think about real output. If, you know, maybe some of you want to go on and become uh, investment bankers or management consultants. How do I even think about what a unit of your output is? What is your product? It's surely not the length of the reports that you write. It's all about the inherent quality. And there's so much of the economy now where these quality aspects are just absolutely inherent to how we think about the economic service that's being provided. So even a haircut, where you can count the number of haircuts or the number of hairdressers, 
Um, you might even you know, decide that output had gone up because people's hair is so long after the pandemic that the haircuts are taking more hair off at the minute. But part of the experience of a hairdresser is um, you know, the quality of the salon and the chat that you have with the hairdresser. And some people like to go to really expensive hairdressers up in the West End and others want you know, a five pound uh, trim from the barber down the road. And so the price itself is a signal of quality, which isn't how we normally think about calculating real GDP using price deflating. Mm -hmm. So all of this really interests me, partly because I like digging into the numbers, but also partly because it raises some really profound concepts about what is productivity when most of the economy is not products, but services? Should you be thinking about how people use their time and the well-being they get out of the things that they're spending doing their time? You know, should we have a time budget constraint as well as a monetary budget constraint in our economic models? So I think this is um, just fantastically interesting territory. It's a long, long-winded way of saying thank you for the question. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, I think yeah. So does you sort of talked to us about you know how, um, you know, sorry. Um, so the, are the concepts you've talked about sort of like reciprocal to the consumer? You've talked about sort of like the free services of social media and how that's on the sort of digital side, and we can't really like assess how you know you know, the sort of value of that in a sense. So do you think this sort of like has um, implications for how the story consumers tell them, uh, themselves about? Because, you know, they get this, state, uh, this um, service for free and it's not exactly clear where the sort of economic cost is. Um, do you think that sort of affects the way people consume these free services? And sort of like, I guess it has implications for like how they sort of, you know, use their personal data, are they more careless with them, um, you know, what they click on, that sort of thing? We don't really know well how to fit a lot of these services into the framework we use for accounting for what's going on. I've been doing a piece of work looking at how much value people say they get from free digital services. And we also included um, competing services that you have to pay for, so news online and printed newspapers, for example, and some free services that are not digital, like being able to go to the local park. And it's clear that consumers assign a high value on average to these services, but it's quite unevenly distributed. And there are age differences, gender differences, even uh, regional differences. Um, and so I think part of the challenge is thinking about the benefit, but also who does the benefit go to? And if you look at a kind of um, general price index, first of all, it doesn't include the free services typically. So if you've got a smartphone, it now has um, a diary and a calculator and a watch and a camera and all kinds of apps that do things that we used to buy gadgets to do. But we still measure the price of smartphone handsets and measure the price of cameras or diaries, we don't measure, we don't use the zero price of the app to measure the timekeeping services and, and that sort of basic good concept. Um, but even setting that aside, um, there's, there's people get huge value from these free digital services and we, we haven't quite figured out what to do about that. Should that become somehow part of GDP, which after all does capture the electricity you use and the fact that you pay for your service plan? Um, or should we just try to measure separately the economic welfare that people get in addition to the market transactions that they make? And if you think that, then there are whole areas of other economic welfare that we don't measure. Uh, benefits from nature, the benefits of going to that public park, which is just as much as the benefits people get from Facebook and actually more evenly shared. Um, so there are lots, lots of public goods that we could think of approaching in the same way. So once you start thinking about, well, measuring GDP and the market economy has these limitations, so let's go broader and try to measure economic welfare, it actually just opens a can of worms about what you ought to include and what approach you should take to distribution. Because GDP ignores income distribution questions, it's just adding up pounds and every pound has the same weight. So I guess the, the argument is that even if, you know, GDP measures 
the sort of economic uh, transactions we make well is not necessarily measuring the right things to use in policy that's supposed to increase welfare and that sort of thing exactly it's essentially your argument um so just one quick question for uh, so that's very relevant obviously to the sort of public policy elements of our talk but just before then i want to ask you um so we sort of like had these discussions about you know what should be included in gdp um is there any sense that this is sort of moved into more of the mainstream of this, uh, discussion in uh, macroeconomics recently? Or has it sort of previously been more concerned with the more niche elements of economics, such as, fe as feminist e economists when it comes to, you know, work in the home or um, other sort of heterodoxes within economics? Or has it always been a sort of level of controversy that it is today? Really interesting question. Um, I think the impetus for thinking about uh, going beyond GDP or thinking about environmental impact actually comes from the policy world more than it does from inside economics themselves, although I think the economists are now starting to catch up with that. There was a um, post by Noah Smith on Substack early this week where he talked about the failure of the mainstream economic journals to um, have many articles about climate change. There are loads of economists working on climate change, including in mainstream economics departments, um, but it, it hadn't yet made it into those sort of core mainstream, um, highly re regarded journals. And I think that's changing, but I think a lot of the impetus change does come from um, many people saying, you tell us GDP has going, been going up, we tell you things have not been getting any better for us, there's something going on. So can we um, start to explore the, this divergence? Yeah, fantastic. Um, so I think that sort of brings us to um, sort of one of the critiques of economics in market state and people is that economics has sort of been too sort of hubristic when it sort of comes to assigning public policy. What were the sort of other sort of well, have you identified any other? Um, so I should explain that market state and people is a sort of textbook that um, it's, uh, you know uh, it's, it's based on, I believe, a course you've taught on um, uh, public policy economics, and um, uh, it's sort of it's it has great reviews from the Financial Times, for example, that um, sort of praise you, I guess, for maybe your sort of humility in how we, uh, how economics as a profession approaches um, uh, public policy. Would you say that's a fair explanation? <laughs> yeah, okay, nodding. Um, so were there sort of any other failures aside from the whole sort of GDP argument that um, you identified that made you want to, that sort of inspired you to sort of correct it, I guess, in this book? Well, the book and the course are designed for people who might be interested in going into public policy roles. And my concern is that people who do that um, don't think there is necessarily an answer that's the correct answer, the single correct answer, or that if there is in a certain context, it's going to be the right answer for all time. And so the book looks at um, the different contexts in which you might think about leaving something to the market and when that gets better outcomes or um, this government intervening in some way. And if it is going to do that, what kinds of interventions um, are likely to be successful? There's a lot of history in it too, to demonstrate that actually there have been different views about this over time. And the fashion uh, in economic thinking has gone from a very uh, government-oriented approach uh, during the wartime and after, after the war, for obvious reasons, you could plan and uh, deliver wartime production, the government got heavily involved in the economy, just as it has in the past 12 months or so. And then we had in this country a Labour government that nationalised lots of industries, introduced the welfare state and the National Health Service, so there a big expansion then in the activities of government. And um, that seemed to go fine for a while, but then broke down. Um, inflation increased growth slowed down, we had the phenomenon of stagflation, partly because of the oil price shocks. And there was a philosophical change too, um, partly in think tanks, but also in economics departments, uh, towards the idea that markets were a better way of organizing economic activity 
um, unless there was something obviously wrong with them, unless there was some market failure. But the right answer or what people thought was the right answer changed as the context changed. It was different in different countries. There've been very many different models of capitalism and some of them are more successful at some times than others. And there's no direct um, straightforward link between what model of market economy does a government operate or a country operate and, and what's its growth performance. There's nothing simple about that at all. And I also want to underline that the reasons that um, markets fail are also exactly the same reasons that governments fail as well. So things that are uh, right at the heart of, for example, modern industrial organization theory and regulatory economics about information asymmetries, they apply just as much to regulators and governments as, um, as they do uh, in private sector transactions. So there are just some circumstances where it's really difficult to get to the ideal uh, use and allocation of resources because of the characteristics of, uh, of that particular sector or that particular activity. And um, so uh, this, is, this is turning into a very long advert for my book. I hope, I hope you read it. But, um, but I, I hope it does have a bit of that humility that you talked about in your question, Anna, but also um, explain why there is this complexity in running modern economies uh, with a lot of intangible goods and relationships matter. So social norms and social capital have a big influence on economic activity. That's fantastic. And I kind of want to go back to um, what you're saying about the amount of history in this um, book as well. It's kind of a pet issue for me, I guess. But um, so do you think that, you know, teaching the history of economic thought is said, not even going back to principle, but going back further to, you know, Ricardo and Mill and Marshall and, um, you know, all the old boys. Um, do you think there's a sort of an impetus to teach this history um, so that we can better assess the, the theory's limitations or do you think it's just better to like get the theory out of the way, make sure people have a, as good a grasp of that as possible and then just sort of leave them to figure it out? Well, I'm, I'm old and so when I did my undergraduate and graduate degree, um, economic history was still very much in the picture and in fact mm -hmm. During the PhD, we had two compulsory economic history courses, and um, I have always really valued that and learned, learned a lot from it. So I'm a big fan of integrating, thinking about what's happened in the economy at different times, so the history part of it, thinking about how that influenced people's ideas, because ideas respond to the events and the crises that people see going on around them. And um, and then what we know about economic theory. So I, I'm not an advocate of, of um, entirely competing interpretations of economics, which is uh, the argument that some of my former students at Manchester were very powerful advocates for this kind of inherently pluralistic approach. Because I think there are things that we learn over time, but it's not like uh, learning over time in, in natural science. And so it's a, a fantastic subject because you do get these blends of two different kinds of epistemology, really, two different kinds of knowledge and having to think about the world. And that makes it really interesting and, and really powerful. But the direct answer to your question is, I think there should be a bit of that and that you should understand, um, you know, why, why Keynes thought, thought what he did in the context of the time and why parts of that might be relevant in 2007, 2008. Yeah, that's, you know, not to say that maths doesn't have any, you should still be doing your econometrics at work, but, um, you know, I guess it's a sort of more um, balanced approach to the subject than maybe these very stringent models with very precise, that would very precise mathematically, sort of have to think more carefully about them. Um, I've also like seen a bit of criticism of the philosophy, maybe misguided criticism from, um, uh, of uh, market station people, uh, where it was Bill, Bill Easterly, I believe, a familiar name for those interested in the mid noughties age debate. Um, it's sort of described as anti-market or something. I imagine you want to like provide a rebuttal to that. Oh, I'm not anti-market at all. I'm, I'm quite pro-market. <laughs> um, but markets are social institutions. And what we're really talking about is what's the best way of organizing um, a society, a large number of people um, to get outcomes that are 
improving the lot in some sense of, uh, of the inhabitants of the jurisdiction. Um, and markets are one form of institution. And so I think about the whole array. So as well as markets and states and this people bit, it's you know, civic organizations, voluntary groups, unions, mutual societies. And there's a, uh, even companies themselves, they're institutions. They're, they are not market economies internally. Um, uh, so there's a great quote from Herbert Simon, I think it was, who said that if a Martian visited earth and looked for uh, the areas of market operation compared to the areas of planned activities. Because of, because of companies, because of corporations, the, the domain of the market is actually far smaller. Um, yeah, so I think this sort of prescribes something else. Um, so sort of viewing maybe government's remit as sort of more than um, sort of a sort of occasionally in the beginning seems to like boost um, economic spending now and then. You know, it's not just from sessions, it's sort of like shaping the way these institution, institutions operate. Um, what sort of, um, you know, what is the sort of ways government can do, can do this and has government up until now been too unambitious to um, take on this role? I just think the way that we think about government intervention has been um, it, it, quite, quite narrow. And a good example would be. I just want to say, sorry, I just want to say, government, maybe I mean economists, the people advising these governments. Um, so I was going to talk about industrial policy. And a lot of people, a lot of economists, resist the idea of industrial policy because they think it's the kind that we had in the 1960s and 70s, where you're pumping in money to companies that are ultimately going to fail. And, and um, it's called picking winners, but the winners always turned out to be losers. And um, the way I think about it is that you shouldn't even think about government money at all. It's not about the money, it's about how does the government coordinate uh, individuals, businesses, people in the market economy to deliver um, good outcomes in areas where there are lots of externalities. If you think about the, the government's new net zero targets, um, it doesn't really need to think so much about what is it going to invest itself in green technologies. It needs to make sure the incentives are there for the private sector. It can do it by guaranteeing a market in 20 years time. It can say, um, we are going to have regulations that say the national grid must buy 100% of its electricity from renewables by such and such a date. And then the private sector will have to make the relevant investments. It can say, Oh, and here are the technical standards that we're going to use because uh, that creates a single large market. And so it improves the economics of investment by the private sector. And so the coordination, aligning people's activities to get the right kind of outcomes that you want, but also the democratic process of deciding what those outcomes should be and that you know, it should be, uh, net zero should be the priority. Um, that's, that's part of of the government's activity. I've slightly lost the thread of your question now, I have to say, Anna. Sorry, no, that's my fault. I'm not particularly coherent today. Um, I think, yeah, that sort of covers what I... I guess um, my question is... Um, no, I think no, I think you have covered it, yeah. Um, and it's sort of leads into what Tim wants to talk about. I'm very sorry. Um, but um, he wants to talk to you a bit more about sustainability. Maybe he can grill you a bit there. <laughs> and, <laughs> As long as there are no carbon emissions from the grilling, that's fine. Oh, <laughs> excellent. So, um, yeah, so on to sustainability. Um, I think there's been a massive uptick in, at least from what I've seen, the interest from economists in sustainability. With a, I think probably the biggest, most high profile one would be Mark Carney and his new book. Now, yourself and Dieter Helm have been very active in the concept of natural capital. And I think as economists, uh, I think we're very familiar with talking about capital goods and capital stock, but could you expand on the concept of natural capital and its consequences for the wider economy? Yeah, thank you. Um, so Dieter um, was the kind of founding member of the Natural Capital Committee and I was a member of that for a while. 
And um, he was very effective in getting the government to take seriously the depreciation of natural capital in the UK. And that's things like what's happened to the climate, but also a striking loss of biodiversity because of farming methods and loss of woodland, um, the pollution of the rivers and the oceans and, and so on, and, and trying to measure what was happening. The idea of calling it a capital is that it automatically makes you think about the long term. And so it embeds sustainability because you to value a capital stock, you have to think about its price over its entire future. And that value is therefore endogenous to the things that you decide to do. And so a particular kind of farming policy will uh, change the value of the natural capital stock of all the little creatures in the soil that give it so much of its goodness. This is not woolly stuff because loss of biodiversity means that agricultural productivity uh, will decline substantially unless nothing is done about it uh, quite quickly to restore biodiversity and particularly soil, soil quality. Um, so there's a hard economic aspect to this. And actually, I think about other capitals as well, not just natural uh, and environmental assets, but also um, social capital, human capital, intangible capital, because thinking about it as wealth or capitals really does uh, put the focus on, on sustainability broadly understood, and that's why I like it. Lots of people in the environmental movement and ecological economists don't like it at all. And it's because they resist the idea that you can bring nature into the monetary economy, as it seems you're doing by trying to put a measure in pounds on these assets. I mean, actually, you'd want to measure the physical characteristics as well as the monetary value. And, and my answer to that is, um, if you don't try to estimate a monetary value, then in all decision making, you're putting a zero there. And I don't know what the right number is, and they're never going to be particularly precise estimates, but I know it's not zero. So I see this as a way of getting it into decision making. Hmm. I mean, we're definitely seeing that decision making, particularly in the financial sector. I mean, I think today JP Morgan announced, I think, 1.5 trillion in financial funding over the next 10 years or so. So we're definitely seeing that perspective. Now, what interests me about that is it seems like a lot of the demand for sustainability is coming from the consumer base and the corporate base who are hedging, sort of hedging their risk against the threat of climate change. And it's, a, it's an interesting concept because sort of leveraging that self-interest in the interest of climate. So sort of whilst before it was often the case of utilising the commons for the uh, private benefit, but now it seems that saving the commons is beginning to incur private benefit on firms pursuing more of a sustainability issue. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think you're right. I think a few things are converging. One is that investors are um, starting to realize the risk to their returns from climate related upheavals, whether that's something direct like things burning down if you're an insurer, um, or just the, the real likelihood of um, significant economic disturbance, movements of people, conflicts and so on because of what's happening with climate change. And so there's huge interest now in the investment community in understanding risks that they hadn't really been thinking about before. Mm. The colleagues of mine here just published a paper um, looking at climate adjusted sovereign debt ratings. And I think pretty much every central bank in the world has wanted to talk to them about it. So that's exactly, exactly mm. what they're interested in. I'm sure we'll see uh, what developments come out of COP26 with regards yeah. to uh, the green the, the central thing, banking. The other thing about the non-investment corporates is that it's partly the consumers, but also partly employees. And there has been a real change, uh, particularly among people of your generation and a bit older, in the priority that they put on this and on taking corporate responsibility seriously. Then a lot of non-financial companies now, I think there is growing interest because they want to incentivize and retain their good employees. I mean, I suppose there is a risk of the sort of greenwashing effect where companies overstate or inflate their environmental credentials in order to attract the uh, highly motivated and ethical youth, and additionally to um, 
almost as a PR front. I mean, what would your thoughts on be sort of ensuring that conflicts of interest is uh, kept under control? And so firms accurately report their climate data as opposed to simply literally coating it in a coat of green paint. Um, I think, I mean, some companies don't even bother greenwashing. They just don't care. There are lots of, you know, not very well behaved companies out there. Um, I, part the, I have a little bit of sympathy for them because there are no standard measures mm. for these things. And the accounting profession is doing so, you know, a lot of work now to try to standardize how do you measure your environmental and sustainable sustainability um, indicators and goals, but that's not there. And so you can't really entirely blame companies for finding things that are easy to, to measure that mm. don't necessarily get to the heart of what you, what you want them to. Mm. Fascinating. Now, I think um, on the subject of uh, things that are challenging to measure, so things that for some people are challenging to comprehend, you've recently done a, a significant chunk of work on the impacts of big data, both within the economics profession and how it's used by policymakers. Could you begin by expanding on sort of the innovations within uh, economics surrounding data? I think, especially from an econometrics perspective. It's all very new. So for, for, in econometrics, it's actually the statistical theory is something that we're all very familiar with. Um, it's just applying it to very much larger data sets. So a lot of economists have used really quite big data sets for a, a very long time. And the machine learning methods are, um, you know, scaled up, reduced form estimation with all of the advantages of having a huge data set, but also all the disadvantages that if there's a break in the structure, your model is going to break down in, in quite bad ways. And there's a famous example of that with uh, Google Blue Trends. And it's partly that they changed the algorithm and, and you know, partly that the context shifted, the, the flu season shifted. Um, so there's that, that, that side of it. The other side of it, and the one that I've been working on is how do we think about data as an economic asset? Mm. Because um, everybody's talking about it. It's not the new oil. It's got completely the opposite characteristics. It's a non-rival good, but there are lots of externalities. A lot of the public policy debate is uh, about privacy and individual personal data. And I think that's kind of hijacked the discussion because there are negative externalities uh, or potentially in terms of loss of privacy. But there are also positive benefits from people being able to access data and join up data that we are missing at the moment because of that. Mm. And so I'm really interested in thinking about if you're an NHS trust and you've got patient data, how should you be thinking about that? Should you uh, sell it to a private company? And if so, what should you charge? Nobody knows. Or should you instead make it available, not openly, but to um, researchers or innovators so that new things can be invented that will benefit the whole of the population at some stage in, in future. So what are the public benefit uses of data? And mm. also the, the competition aspects. I was on something called the Furman panel that looked at competition in digital markets and some very big companies have built up such large hordes of data that they can both make money from selling more advertising and also mm ever better services and that keeps other people out so it's a, it's a barrier to entry in in those markets and so the discussion was that involved in the new digital was that involved in the new digital markets unit component that's, that's what they're thinking about so they're thinking mm. about should you make data interoperable um uh, should you think about other industries the way that they have about open banking where people mm. can give permission for their data to be used it's accessible through a standardized API in standardized formats for fintechs to come into the market. Mm, very interesting. Now, I think uh, Rich has put in the chat for moving from uh, public data to your private digital assets and uh, your thoughts on the considerations of Bitcoin and NFTs. Now, I'm sure Rich has been acutely aware of the uh, uptick in Dogecoin, but uh, what would be your, um, your overall thoughts on the new crypto uh, currencies? And, uh, I have to assets? I have to confess, I don't understand it very well. I don't uh, either, so we're in, uh, we're in cahoots there. <laughs> um, so we've got the central bank analog currency, which is the cash. Um, and we've got 
digital private currencies, which is every time you go and use your debit card in the supermarket. Um, so do we need a central bank digital currency? I don't really know. The, the, the NFTs I find very interesting because the art market is very interesting. And mm. it was created by um, a dealer who just really kind of invented the idea of old masters and pitched them to the wealthy um, oligarchs of the, 19, of the late 19th century and early 20th century. So this, it's an entirely artificial scarcity in that sense. And there are all kinds of discussions about are paintings ever really authenticated as Leonardo da Vinci's or did they just come from his studio? So that, that whole market is fascinating. And now there are JPEGs that are selling mm. billions of dollars. It's just truly bizarre. I don't really understand mm. it. I think we should ask Richard to answer his own question. Um. I think you basically just answered it, Diane. I think it's a way to create scarcity. So um, one of the things that I think is very interesting about your work, uh, which I've taken a lot from over the years, is the way you just, you don't just, you the way you focus on fundamental questions. And so you guys started talking, talking about the production boundary. And I just commend anyone to just look at, Google it, look at it, and just see how bizarre it is. It's just a kind of, philosophical thing really um it's a made up thing and we had jacob goldstein earlier in the term who was talking about money um one of the fundamental things that one needs to think about hard if you're going to understand things properly as an economist i think is scarcity exactly how it works so that for and and particularly the sort of four by two two by two box of um public private club goods and so on NFTs, um, the way it's very new, but I think what's going on is there's a fundamental problem uh, in the online uh, market, which is uh, online art market, which is an, a, a fundamental lack of scarcity. Uh, and so how do you make something? How do you privately own it? Um, and it's a way to allow people to create a one to one link with that JPEG with that um, piece of online art, what, video, whatever form it takes. Now, people quickly say, aha, you idiot. People can just screen grab it and then send it everywhere. So it's not really scarce, but you know, aha, if you think, really think about the way art, market work, art markets work, JP Morgan, let's say most famously, he bought loads of art. What did he do? He stuck it in a museum. Uh, so that everybody could see it. So typically people that invest in art do want other people to see it, but they want it to be known that they own that art. And I think that's what's going on with NFT. So these people don't mind that you can screen grab their art, but they take value from the fact that somewhere they can be shown as a patron of the arts because they bought this thing and they're the only one that was able to do that. I think I'm right in saying as a footnote, Richard, that JP Morgan donated the paintings to museums because he was uh, being chased by the Internal Revenue Service that was part of the settlement. Is that true? Well, collectors over the ages. Uh, maybe that was a, I didn't. I didn't know that. I knew I've been to the J.P. Morgan Gallery. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. There's, um, there's a fantastic biography called Duveen about this dealer whose name was I think it was Joseph Duveen who who invented the old masters market. So if anybody's really interested, I commend it to you. Mm. We'll see what happens to uh, J.P. Morgan of today after uh, single-handedly financing the downfall of European football. However, that's a, uh, an issue for another day. Um, I'd like to move on to questions and answers now, see if uh, we've got any uh, hot takes from the uh, audience. So anyone with any uh, questions, put them in the chat at all. I might in, interject quickly. I, I find this art discussion quite interesting, um, I, especially when you're talking about how authentic you can ever consider art to be and how... Um, sort of art market, our markets react to say perceptions of the change of scarcity. It was recently claimed that a Leonardo da Vinci, Salvatore um, Mundi, that Mohammed bin Salman uh, bought for a very high cost, perhaps like as broke some sort of record, um, was a forgery. Um, so I guess like, do, are art markets somehow unique in the way that sort of change in scarcity creates sort of like, massive marginal effects on the sort of value of um, an artist's work. And um, I guess what Rich was saying about David Morgan sort of displaying the fact that he was a patron of the arts, um, this must sort of sort of show 
art, like works of art, to be some sort of vaguely good, I suppose. Um, so I think the art market is really distinctive. There are obviously other positional goods, so not many people can have, you know, Highland castles and so on. So there's a bit of that to it. But there's a great TV series called Fake or Fortune. And they go through the whole process of authentication. You know, is the paint the right age? When you x-ray the picture, what do you see underneath it? Is it in the right style? What's its provenance and so on? And it's often a very marginal decision. And that changes the value by orders of magnitude. And it's really bizarre when you think about it. But here is this object with some aesthetic qualities. And yet its value is either uh, 10,000 pounds or 10 million pounds, depending on a very fine judgment indeed, not at all a scientific process. I guess, um, you know, the same sort of, you were talking earlier about haircuts, how people will spend a lot of money on a haircut because it has a high cost and therefore it's a sort of indicator of its quality without necessarily being a better haircut. So, um, I, I guess I don't really have a question at the end of this, but um, it's very interesting how um, interesting. Yeah. sort of, um, you know, status uh, sort of changes the way things are valued. Um, and I also wanted to ask you a bit about um, something you were talking about earlier with Tim, uh, the whole idea that, you know, the youth, our generation, are um, <laughs> youth are more um, sort of willing, are more like engaged with environmental issues and how, um, but the point Tim made was maybe they're more susceptible to greenwashing. Is this a sort of a sign that, you know, this sort of sort of self-interest motive for um, uh, sort of investing in more sustainable technology isn't enough, we should still go further to uh, ensure that the cost of environmental damage are sort of more internalized by these um, uh, investment firms. I think we're gonna to have to do quite a lot to hit the targets and avoid um, uncomfortably high increases in, in temperatures and loss of biodiversity. It's, you know, eating less meat and dairy produce, um, traveling less. So it's gonna take changes in our behavior as well as changes in technology uh, through investment in, in um, you know, lighter planes or planes made of graphene or new electricity grids or, or what have you. Um, it's just really quite a big societal change. I'm not sure how successfully we're going to do it, to be honest. I've become quite interested in the narratives governments and others tell about the economy. And this started from the GDP work because GDP figures get revised and they get revised over a period of years. So stories that we tell ourselves about recessions. Is this building um, on some like Robert Schiller's work? Yeah. Mm. So they get revised away. And one example of a great counterfactual history was late 1970s, um, uh, the ratio of uh, uh, government debt to GDP looked like it was rocketing, balanced payments was, was rocketing, Dennis Healy, um, had to leave, um, had to come back from the airport when he was leaving to go to Washington to um, sort out the crisis and the IMF got called in to bail Britain out. And that crisis was shaped by looking at these ratios to GDP and the collapse in GDP was the reason that the ratios had gone up. And then the collapse in GDP got partly revised away as the years went by. And so if you run the counterfactual history, if it hadn't been quite so bad, and if the Labour government hadn't called in the IMF, might they have clung on at the 1979 election and Mrs Thatcher not happened? And then the course of uh, British economic history would have been very different. But, you know, the, the Robert Schiller book, I think, is interesting because it gives examples of other kinds of narratives. And I think quite often when you're thinking about big changes in the future that you want to bring about, a narrative is helpful. So Tony Blair's Claude Britannia got very mocked but I think in a way it was part of an economic policy to get people optimistic, investing, thinking about the dynamic parts of the economy, the creative sector and so on. Um, so yeah, I think the narrative's a, a really interesting direction that some economists are taking now. I don't want to push back on that a bit. So what you're sort of talking about here are sort of two kind of very different responses to the climate crisis. One is sort of like 
creating narratives to change individual behavior, such as, you know, eating less meat, that sort of thing. Another is, um, you know, a sort of bigger institutional change that, you know, no matter what individuals do, it still needs to happen. And I guess what I want to ask is that even if, you know, you know, people in the UK, people in the US eat, you know, less meat, is it going to counteract the sort of like massive, you know, rise in consumption of, um, you know, meat and dairy and other parts of the world in the developing world? And um, to that extent, how sort of useful are these narratives in preventing climate change and how uh, is it, is there an argument sort of just like sort of ditching them and just like rely on government, you know, and pushing them to do the bulk of the work to affect this institutional change? I don't know, actually. Um, I mean, it's obviously a global problem and governments of countries like India and China, um, whatever you think about their democratic status or lack of it, have to have satisfied populations. So they are never going to say, and actually I think it'd be morally indefensible to us and to say, um, you can't attain the standard of living that we have attained in the West. Um, and that means that there's a corresponding increase in the amount of change that we have to um, bring about ourselves in our own um, boundaries. I don't know if it can happen. This is a terrible global collective action problem and we don't have the institutions to be sure that we'll get a successful outcome. I think it's very interesting yeah. discussing the idea of narratives with respect to like the discussions of values and institutions and sort of the broader picture of what an economy is i mean i i disagree with that i would say that the uh, the idea of the narrative transcends the uh, government itself it, in, it, it engrosses itself within the government it engrosses itself within the private sector and like we were previously discussing within these uh, activist youth workers of tomorrow um also i back schiller because he's got a nowhere prize and again forgive me for the appeal to authority but i think uh, I, do, I do like a bit of schiller now and then um, so no, I, I think the development and appreciation of narratives, I think, really reflects a sort of deeper change in economics, sort of being less myopic and more open and inclusive to a wider range of perspectives. There's a real interest in narratives in other disciplines. So in AI and areas of science, there is um, an interest in the consequences of, of um Adverse narratives, you know, vaccine denial, um, the AI is going to kill us all, those kinds of narratives. And um, so it's not just economics. Mm, I mean, like, uh, yeah. as far back as uh, Max Weber, the Protestant ethic of capitalism, I think the sort of uh, underlying, sort of underlying intrinsic beliefs and motivations behind uh, econ. Again, I think going back to the economic history point, I think it's really important to consider those in the wider discussion. Yeah, I mean, I want to interject this. I'm not saying narratives aren't, aren't important. You know, I'm a great believer in sort of teaching of history of economic thought. But um, I feel like sometimes we have to sort of like think about maybe the limitations of it and how narratives, you know, pervade in national politics, uh, politics to a great extent. We might be, sort of overestimate the extent to which they mm. permeate, you know, international populations. And that ultimately is what they kind of need to do if we're going to solve this crisis. But I want to, so Ben's question doesn't get ignored, I do want to ask it, and it is relevant to this um, narrative point um, about how economists, he says, are broadly in agreement that carbon taxes are um, a good policy, one of the best policies to tackle the climate crisis, but the public don't agree. And he points out that you are one of the founders of the Bristol Festival of Economics, you know, on our doorstep. And um, he wants to ask how important is it going forward that economists communicate more effectively with the public regarding, regarding climate change? Well, you have on the call um, the two co-directors of the Bristol Festival of Economics with me and Richard. Uh, so it would be a great one uh, in 2021. Um, obviously, I think communicating is important and what I like about the festival is that it's really communicating it's two way. It's not um, just one, one direction, economists shouting louder or more trying to be clearer so that people understand us. It's also learning more about what questions are salient to people, how they think about issues. And that's, that's really important. So um, I, I obviously uh, agree that communication is key, public understanding is key. Um, 
And I think on the carbon tax itself, economists do think carbon tax is a good thing. More and more economists think actually it's not going to be sufficient and we should try any policy uh, that's going to get us, allow us to make progress on moving towards net zero because it's getting pretty urgent now. But let's throw everything at it. I once met Thomas Schelling uh, in a workshop to talk about why international negotiations about climate were so unsuccessful. And he made the really interesting point that by framing it all as a debate about what's the um, impact on average global temperatures going to be, that was a very bad focal point for the game that um, had been set up because you can't measure it until after it's happened. So last year's temperature, you've got to wait until the year's ended. And it's not a, a particularly clear measure. There are different ways of, of constructing it. So he was advocating for a different kind of metric of success. Let's say what portion of world um, energy generation is contributed by renewables. And that would be easier to monitor. So I thought that was an interesting idea. It was not too long before, before he died. I think it's very interesting. I think um, sort of communicating to the public. I mean, I think within economics itself, because the climate is such a complex issue that permeates such vast parts of the economy, showing that causal link and the change and also making that causal link digestible to people who may not be able to uh, do a deep dive into today. So I think that's definitely something to consider when it comes to communicating policy, especially to the lay person. It's communication, but it's also narratives and social norms. You know, we all recycle and um, that's become a second nature and it's become a social norm, but it's also come about because of government regulations on local councils that they had to recycle a certain proportion of the waste. So I think it's a mixture of all of these things, the economic incentives, uh, the social change and, and government intervention of the different kinds. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Diane. I think that's more or less all we have time for. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Diane and Richard for contributing. And sorry if we've sort of let you on a bit of a down note we're talking about the climate crisis. <laughs> Hopefully, nevertheless, you've um, you know, found many interesting things in this talk to take away and um, think about.